Because we have felt your presence. We live and we breathe to experience you. It's the only true value of life. All other values fade away. But in your presence is fullness of joy. <laughs> Why do we laugh in your presence, God? Because it's fullness of joy. <laughs> oh, God. Your glory, your presence is my home. Your glory and your presence is my home. It's where I live. It's where I get my breath. <laughs> It's where I eat. It's where I drink. Oh, Lord, your glory amazes me. <laughs> amazes me. Your glory thrills me. There's such joy in you. No darkness at all. <laughs> Praise your awesome. Praise your awesome. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, before I begin our regular Bible study, I always like to keep you aware of what's happening in the world and how that relates to the Word of God. And today, we have a prophetic happening in the world. It's not uh, probably, maybe tonight, I don't know, but uh, early this afternoon had not yet really been announced all over the USA. But in world news, if you watch news from other countries, you get information early because their days are before ours. No. In Korea, it's already Wednesday. So when you hear what happened Tuesday in Korea, that means it's what's happening today, uh, yesterday or today. It happened there yesterday. Well, the news you know, from the world news is that yesterday, today, yesterday there, today here, North Korea moved two or more, they said one or more, the U.S. government thinks two um, missiles closer, one to the South Korean border, the other one to a different place um, that could be fired at Japan or could be fired at the United States. Now, there's a Bible verse about this, so you don't have to worry. If you read the Bible, you know what's happening and what God's going to do, and I'm going to read you the Bible verse about it so you will know. You can look in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19. I want everyone to have time to find this in your Bible. You're going to need to look at it over and over. Isaiah 59. 19, Isaiah, Isaiah 59, 19, 
I don't have this on a slide because I just received this revelation about 10 minutes before church started. Isaiah 59, verse 19. If you want to find it back there and show it up on the screen, that'd be good. 59, 19. It says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the West. Who is the West? Here. America is the West. Now, what did we just sing? I'm not afraid. Why? We don't have to fear the Lord. We are his children. But the wicked have to fear him. Okay. So when we hear about things like this in the news, it causes people's hearts to be afraid. See, what's going to happen to us? Okay, we're going to... We're going to read this, what it says. So that's talking about America, the West. Then it says, And his glory from the rising of the sun. Who is the country that picture is the rising of the sun on their flag? Japan. Japan, they have a white flag with a big red sun. They are called the land of the rising sun. That's Japan. Okay, so now we have the same thing that happened in the news today. America heard that North Korea has their missiles ready. And they were, you know, the alert number went up, up. You know, we have alert numbers, one, two, three, four, five, you know, so forth. We have been on three. Now, increase to four. Okay. Means one, no worries. Two, there. No. Three, watch. Be careful, watch. Four, pay attention. Five, the bomb is on the way. Okay? That's how American government counts the trouble we are in. Right now, the government thinks we are in trouble number four. Pay attention. Okay. Why did my computer go like that? Now let's read more. Okay, it says, When the enemy comes like a flood. Okay. Now, in this situation, the enemy is North Korea. Okay. Many, many times, North Korea, well, North Korea, Korea controls the water in that area of the country. And they are all, they have big dams to block the water, to keep the water controlled. And they're always threatening South Korea. North Korea is communist. South Korea is free. 
America went to Korea in 1950s. I think, Brother Ed, did you go to Korea? Brother Ed fought in Korea for the South, okay, in the 1950s. A long war. It lasted a long time. Okay. So North Korea is always threatening to South Korea. We will let the water out and it will flood you. This verse says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what will happen? The Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. Many times in the Bible, the word lift up a standard means to raise a flag. But there is another interpretation for that word in the Greek there's, or in the Hebrew. There's another interpretation for that. The other interpretation is the Lord will blow against it. That's what's happening in the world today. God is in control. God is in control. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Show me your glory. This is an opportunity for God to reveal himself to the world. There's a lot of wicked people out there that need to see God blow and save their life so they can be thankful to God and come and worship him. So that's what's happening in our world today. I want you to know God has all the answers. This word right here, you need to study this. Yes. Okay, that's why we came, Bible study. Todd. I don't understand why North Korea and South Korea are, you know, the same race, but they're enemies. Because part of that country is smart enough to know they want to be free. The other part of the country wants to be communist. They have some rulers who want to control and own everything in the North. The South wants to be free. So that's why they war even though they're the same race. Same as in the USA in the beginning, or in the Civil War. We fought against ourselves because some people wanted everyone in America to be free. Other people wanted slaves. So we fought to free everyone. That's why the war went on and on and on, and thousands and thousands of people died. And same thing in Korea. Okay, tonight, we're talking about pursuing humility. Why do we want to be humble? Who remembers from last week why we want to be humble? She said, Belinda said Jesus was humble, right? But remember, we're studying what? The Emmanuel factor or the manifest presence of God. The presence of God comes to humble people. The Bible says God resists the proud. but exalt the humble. I want God to stay close to me. After you just heard what I told you, you should want God to stay close to you too. We all do. 
I'm not afraid because I know God is close to me. See? So now it's my responsibility to stay humble. Humility means stay low. It means not getting a big head, but getting a small head. Someone who thinks small about themselves. Not a dumb person, no. But um, I've seen students in school, some very bright students. And mostly, all of the very bright students are proud of their intelligence. And when the teacher asks the question, those smart kids, bum, 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 I know, 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 call me, pick me, pick me, pick me, I know. They know. That's human nature. I want to give the right answer and have everyone in the class go, whoa, he's smart, she's smart. Yeah. I always had that problem at Sunday school when I was a kid. See, when you're the preacher's kid, you go to church every time the door is open. And it you learn the word of God very quickly, and you know all the stories in the Bible. And you know the answer to every question. Now, at regular school, I was not that smart. I was just normal. So I didn't know the answer to every question. But at Sunday school, I knew the answer to every question. And my mom and dad, they had to sit down with me and tell me, you can't answer every time. Don't just spit out the answer. Wait. Give some other people a chance to think about it. And maybe they will have an answer too. See? We have to learn that. Now, here we are. You know, I always admire uh, the Korean pastor and the Korean people. You know, they demonstrate their humility. It's like if you're old and you have white hair like me, when I go over there, they all bow, bow, bow to me because they're respecting my age and they're respecting the fact that I'm a pastor. Now, always, and you notice when Pastor Pat comes over here on Sundays to pray with us, together with us, he always bows. He always shows us great respect because we're old. <laughs> no. It's good to be old. There's some good things that happen when you get old. So don't worry. If you're young, don't be afraid of old. It's pretty good. Okay. So God wants us to be humble, and that's why we're, you know, God stays close when I'm humble. God withdraws when I'm proud. I don't want God to get tired of going back and forth to heaven all the time. I want him just to stay here. I'm going to show you some verses about that, but let's look at principle six. God's manifest presence is attracted to hum humble, and it says, attracted. God, you know, he's there, and he sees you being humble, and he's like, ooh. And then it says, he's attracted and attached. Attached. Oh, I want God to be attached to me. I want God to be attached to me. God's attracted and attached to me if I stay low. When I get proud. No. My husband and I, we're, we're working on being humble with each other. We're working on that. It's about time. 
you know, we've only been married for 40, almost 44 years. You know, it's, it's about time we started being humble to each other. We're working on that, and it's not an easy job. Because we grew up like kids together. Kids are always like slapping around words, you know, word game. You know, with each other. Like brothers and sisters do. See, well, we were kids together. You know, I was 13 years old when I first started uh, loving him. See, and he was young. He was 15. We were young, you know. So that's just been our habit. And many times people misunderstand that. They don't understand because, you know, they think, ooh, 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 what's that? You know, they don't understand until they learn to know us better. And they realize it's all a game. This is all a game we play. But we're, we're working on that together, trying to show more humility with each other, with each other. We learn to do that with each other, then maybe we'll try to be more humble with you next. <laughs> God has a soft heart for humble people. God, you know, uh, there's this there's this phrase that uh, that men uh, use. If a man thinks he's handsome, a young a young guy that's not married, uh, thinks he's handsome, he wants to put a label on, you know, I mean, he, in his mind, he has this label, and it, it says, chick magnet. Chick magnet. What does that mean? It means all the pretty girls with the nice figures are attracted to him. He's a chick magnet. That one handsome boy in school and all of the girls want to be with him. He's called a chick magnet. I know you deaf people have not heard that term probably, but maybe some of the young ones have. I don't care about a a chick magnet. If you're a man of God, you shouldn't worry about being a chick magnet you should worry about being a God magnet. Pull God close to you with your humility. I love it that God is attracted to the humble because anyone can be humble. Not everyone can be handsome. Not everyone can be beautiful. And even if you are born handsome or beautiful, you're going to get old. And you're not going to be as handsome and beautiful as you are now. See? Yeah, your, your chin's going to start hanging down here. You know, you're going to have lines in your face. And it's like, you know, it doesn't matter how beautiful you were when you were young. You just wait a while. So I'm happy that God doesn't say, oh, I'm attracted to the beautiful people. You know, or I'm attracted to the rich people. You know, it's hard to become rich. It's hard to become beautiful, but it's possible for everyone to become humble. Brother Ed. You can't stay young forever, but you can be humble forever. And God is fascinated with that. That's why I want to become humble. 
It says, um, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those who have a humble or grieved spirit. For this says the high and lofty one, that's God, who lives, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Now, this verse is going to tell you what God says. I love this in verse uh, 15, verse Isaiah 57, 15. I love the last part of this. This is a quote from God. He says, I live in a high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one or the repentant one. Contrite means people who quickly repent. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, God. That's contrite. It says, he says, he dwells in a high and holy place with those humble and quickly repentant people. When God looks at the place that humble people live, in his mind, it's a high and holy place. See, when we look at humble, we think it's a low and pitiful place place. But wrong. God looks at a humble person and he says, that is a high place for me to dwell. It's a high, not only a high place, but a holy place too. Look at Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. I love this. It says, heaven, this is God talking, heaven is my throne, the earth my footstool. That means God sits in heaven, earth. That's what the verse means. He says, Where is the house that you will build me? He says, Can you build me a house as big as that? Can you build me a place of worship that's big, equal to heaven throne and earth? putting my foot up on it? And of course, the answer is no. I can't. I can't build a house like that. No. He says, and where is the place of my rest? See, you go home to rest. After church tonight, you will go home to rest. I will go home and put my feet up. I always sit with my feet up, my place of rest. You know when you go in your house, at the end of the day, you've worked all day, you've been busy, and you go in your house, and you just sit down, and it feels so peaceful and comfortable just to go in there and just sit down. God says, where do I rest? Where is the home where I want
want to just go and put my feet up. He says, for all of those things, my hand made. God said, I made the earth. I can put my feet on it if I want. I made that. You know? He says, I've made everything. You can't make anything for me. He says, all of those things I made still exist. They didn't become old and pass away. They're still going. Yeah. Says the Lord. Verse 2. But on this one will I look. God says, I have made everything, but I will look at this one. On him who has a poor. Poor does not mean money broke. It means heart soft, humble, and a repentant spirit who trembles at my word. It means the people who read the Bible and they feel, ooh, I need to change, I need to change, I need to change, I need to improve. Those people, those humble people, not the ones that look at the Bible and go, oh, finish, 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 oh, finish. Oh, I know that. Ten Commandments, finish, 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 finish. oh, finish. No. He says, the ones that, that know in their heart they need more, they need more, they need more. They're repenting, they're repenting. They're reading the Word of God and go, ooh, I don't have that yet. I need to improve on that area. When they read about the love of God, you know, they read about how Jesus wants us to love our neighbor. They don't go, oh, I love my neighbor. Finish. I brought them a card last year, Christmas time. No. God says, they read that and they go, ooh, it's been a long time since I brought my neighbor cookies. I need to do something for my neighbor to show them I love them. Because the word of God says I need to do that. See? It's like the one, God says, I'm fascinated, I'm drawn to, I'm going to look at the one who is humble and contrite in his spirit and trembles when he reads my word. So oh, then, how do I become more humble? I know I need, but how? See, it's easy to know what, but it's harder to understand how. Because our proud person inside keeps trying to speak up when he needs to shut up. I mean, be quiet. How do I become more humble? First, give my heart to God. The Bible says, you are not your own. Let's put that in English. In English. You don't own yourself. You don't own yourself. The Bible says you were bought with a high price. Jesus died to buy you back from Satan. You were bought. Jesus bought you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, you've accepted him, then he bought you. His death paid for you a high price. 
a diamond paid for a piece of coal. No. Just imagine if you were getting ready to barbecue out in your backyard and someone showed up and said, I have a, a bag of diamonds. And they poured it out and they were like all these big old diamonds. It was like shining, shining in light. He said, I will trade you for coal, one coal for each diamond. You would think that person was crazy, right? God the Father traded his diamond, Jesus, for a piece of black coal, you and me. So we give our heart to God. We say, God, I give my life, my whole life, everything about me, I give it to you. You make decisions for me. I give up the right to rule myself. If you are a Christian, you will never be independent. You might move out of mom's house or dad's house someday. Probably you will. But if you are a Christian, you won't be independent. Not if you're humble and you've given yourself to God. Oh, don't get me. See, God owns me. He's not a visitor in my house. God is not a visitor in your life. You are God's home. And he owns the house. It's not a rental. He bought me. He bought me. He bought me. I have some little notes. I can't remember them all. I have to look. All right, yeah. This happens all the time. People come to pastor and say, Pastor, I want to do something for God. What can I do? That's all wrong. We think that's good, but it's all wrong. You go to God. You say, here I am, God. What do you want me to do? And then you go to pastor and say, pastor, God wants me to do this. And pastor talks to God, if God tells him the same story as he told you, then now it's your turn to do it. Some people come to pastor and God told them this, and they come and say, pastor, we need to do this. And pastor goes, uh, not we. God didn't tell me. God told you. Not we. You. God told me what to do, I do that. God told you what to do, you do that. But, 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 as a, <laughs> did God tell you? Well, then you have a choice. Go home, sit down, do nothing, or obey God. Second, serve God actively. This, I'm 
not serving God. This is worship. And this is just sitting before God. What servant sits down in his master's presence? None. The masters of the world, they don't tell their servants, oh, come and sit with me. The master, you know, the master just tells the servant what to do when the servant goes out and does it and waits until the master calls them again and gives them more work. And more work, and more work, and more work. And if the master goes in the kitchen and sees all the servants in there talking and talking and laughing and playing around, he thinks of something for them to do and says, go work. And what happens at your job if your boss catches you text messaging all day? It's like, I'm paying you to work, not to text. Put that text in your pocket or leave it at home. You came here to work. I'm paying you to work. Serving God is activity. It's doing something for him. It's doing something for him. Something that he needs done. Some people think they're serving God if they stop doing bad things. I stopped all my sin. That means I'm serving God. No, you stopped all your sin. You're obeying God now, but you served nothing yet. What are you doing? Doing. Doing is action. It's action. Every Sunday, Sherry does something back there. Mabel does something back there. Eduardo does something back there. They're serving. They're serving. Every Sunday, Belinda goes back there with the kids. She's serving. She's serving. You know, there's people who serve, and there's people who sit. Do you know that in every church they've done research, they've counted 20% of the people do all the serving. 80% sit. Now, let me tell you about sitting, the problem with sitting. What's wrong with sitting? I had a friend before in a, a, a wheelchair. Actually, she was my boss. She was in a, a wheelchair. And everyone was always asking her because she pushed herself around in that wheelchair all the time. And she wasn't a young person. Uh, she wasn't old equal to me, but close. And she was like pushing herself. And everyone was always asking her because she had a good job. She could afford it. Why you don't get an electric wheelchair? And her answer was always the same. If I get an electric wheelchair, I will lose the strength I have. And I will become more helpless. And I will need someone to take care of me. The people in the church who are just sitting become helpless. And they need someone to take care of them. The people who are working in the church become strong. And they can help others. They can help newly saved people. But if you're just sitting, 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 doing nothing, you're not serving God. You're just sitting down with God. This is powerful. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about history. John Wilbur Forth from England. He was um, the man responsible. He, he was a politician. 
in England. And he started in politics when he was 25 years old. He was young. And he became a Christian. And the Lord started telling him how to serve God in the government of England. And God began to show him things that needed to change. And one, the biggest thing he did, he did many, 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 a long list of really good things. But the number one top good thing he did was that he was responsible uh, for England freeing the slaves without war. You know, in America, our slaves were freed through war. And our, our president, Lincoln, was responsible for causing that and making sure that was a success. But John Wilberforce was just a young man, 25 years old, and God put this burden on his heart. And um, he had a friend who was a preacher, and the preacher friend was famous. His name is John Wesley. And this is what John Wesley said to John Wilberforce. He said, Unless God raised you up or birthed you for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God is for you, who can be against you? The preacher was telling him, what you want to do, service for God, is hard. It will be hard. Men will hate you, and devils will fight you. You better be sure that's God. And he's young, 25 years old. Imagine. Who here? 25. Anybody? 25? Close 25? Oh, back there we have someone close to 25. 21, yeah. You imagine, you know, you're given this huge responsibility. Change your nation. Why was it so hard? Because the men were rich in the government. Like our Congress today. They were rich. And they all owned slaves. And they would vote. So this young man had to convince them to give up their slaves and start cleaning their own house. Their wives start washing their own dishes. It was a hard job. Their families had been wealthy and they did nothing. They were just like... Socialize, 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 socialize. That's all they did. It was a hard job. Now, oh, let me go back. Oh, oh yeah, okay. America, we need right now a young man or a young woman like John Wilbur. Someone who could stand up to the politicians and not be afraid. Stand up against the media and not be afraid. Stand up against abortion. Stand up against uh, homosexual marriages. Stand up against the child abuse. Stand up against, you know, divorce. A man or a woman who sees that the best hope for America is not in their army. That's what John Wilberforce said. He said the best hope for England is not in our armies. He says the best hope for England is
is not in her politicians, her rulers, the king, the queen, but in the spirit of her people, in the persuasion that she still contained many people who in this degenerate age love and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, we can say that about America. The best hope for America is not in our president. And it doesn't matter who is president. The best hope for America is not in the president. The best hope for America is in the pew of every church in America. Christians can change the world. There are millions of us. There might be a few here tonight, but imagine every church in America. You told that. There's millions of Christians. That's our best hope for the future. But not if we are sitting Christians. Only if we are serving Christians. There are many who still love God. John Wilberforce got a, a group of people. Come on, come on, come on. They agreed together. They were working together. They were trying to achieve together. John Wilberforce almost lost his mind in his fight to free slaves. He almost, demon spirits just oppressed him so much. He almost went crazy. He was very physically, the enemy attacked him, and he was very, very sick for a long time. It took him 49 years to succeed. That man fought for what God wanted for 49 years. And the week that they voted to free the slaves was the same week he died. He didn't just sit on the pew and be Christian. He served a purpose. His life was for something awesome. If you never the story about John Wilberforce before. There is a wonderful movie that you can get and watch, and it's called Amazing Grace because he was friends with the man who wrote the, the song Amazing Grace. He was, they were friends. So the movie is called Amazing Grace, but it's the life story of John Wilberforce and what he did, and it's awesome. It's awesome. But he was fearless. No fear. You can't accomplish for God if you're afraid. See, faith and fear don't mix. Faith and fear don't mix. Christians who have the Emmanuel factor and have been attractive and attached to God will be without fear. If God is attached to me, why should I be afraid?
the Emmanuel factor will not attach to lazy or fearful people. If you want the heavy anointing of God on your life, you cannot be lazy. You cannot be afraid. Now, we all go through different stages of life. Now, little children, babies, zero to three years old, can't really do much for the church. They really can't do much for serving. No. If you ask a one-year-old to serve coffee, something bad is going to happen back then. So we don't ask them, right? We're smart enough not to ask them. But, you know, you give them something to serve they can do. You have, like, the two-year-old kids in our church can go down each pew and pick up one of those marker boards and bring it and put it in a bag. They can serve, even though they're small. They can. A two-year-old child can put their hand on your head and pray for you, and I'm telling you, that is powerful. Because a two-year-old child was recently with God before they were born short time, two years ago, they were with God. Me, it's been 64 years since I was with God. Long time. So there's a lot of power in a two-year-old prayer. And if you ask a little baby two years old, will you pray for me? They will. Most of the time, they will. And it's very powerful. You should try it. Then, you know, it's like they grow and we go through. When you're young and strong, you can serve hard. You can serve, 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 serve. You can wear yourself out serving because you know tomorrow you'll feel strong again. When you get away over here and you become 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, the service is different. You know, I hope when my husband is 70 or 80 years old, that this church is not still asking him to climb that ladder and go up there and change those heavy lights. Yeah, he says no problem, but yes, problem. Yes, problem. That is not the will of God. It is not. It's not the young people honoring the old people, what the Bible teaches. You know, there comes a time when what you do to serve becomes different. There was a time I could work teaching school all day and bring money to the church and to my family and, you know. But the time for that stopped. My body wouldn't let me work all day 40 hours a week and then come to the church and work 40 more hours. My body said, no, enough. Choose one job, that one or this one. I walked in that day. I told my husband, I'm finished with work. I'm working for God until I die. But I will tell you, I'm not as strong working for God now as when I was 30 or 40 or 50. And I get tired. And I tell my husband, I have to go home now. It's 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Yesterday we went home. It was after 5. I said, enough. I'm going home now. <laughs> you know. I want the Emmanuel factory to be attached to me. I'm going to keep working for God. I'm going to keep working for God. But what I can achieve for God may be different. People keep asking me, when are you going on another missions trip? 
mission trip are for the young, I can tell you. I mean, I don't know if I have the strength or the energy to do another missions trip to Africa or to India. You know, when I was 50, that was okay. But now I'm starting to feel like, oh, I remember when I was in the Philippines, it was so hot. Whew. I don't know if I can do that again. And all that walking, 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 I'm not as young as I used to be. And you have to run to jump on those jeepneys. I don't think I can do that anymore. Now they'll run off and leave me, and I'd be standing there going, oh, what am I going to do now? See, what you can do for God changes. But I will tell you this. When I'm 90, I will still be able to come and sit right there and pray before the Lord. I can still serve the church. I might not be the pastor anymore, probably not, but I can still serve the church by praying and interceding for the church and for the pastor, whoever that is. God is a moving God. God is not lazy. Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. This is my paraphrase. And the Spirit of the Lord moved on the face of the deep. God's Spirit was moving, 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 moving. In Acts, we see the Spirit of God moved with wind and with fire. We see the moving of God. We see the story of Jesus moving from place to place to place to place. God is a busy God. He moves, he moves, he moves, he moves, he moves, he works, he works, he works, he works. And he's a lot older than me. So, we know that to become humble, we need belong to him. Let him own me. I am the house he bought to live in. Let him own me. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If I want to become humble, I can't be afraid. See, people who are afraid are worried about self, 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 self. Something's going to happen to me. I'm afraid. Something's going to happen to me. I'm afraid. Something's going to happen to me. I'm afraid. If God owns you, let him take care of it. Trust him. It's easy if I give myself to him, I say, God, here I am. I belong to you. You are responsible. If I own something, a house, I'm responsible to take care of it, to mow the grass, to plant the flowers, to clean the house, to paint the house, to put the new roof on. If I own it, I am responsible. If God owns me, he is responsible. When I get sick, I'm like, God, hello, you're responsible. I'm not going to worry about this. You. It's a good thing to let God own you. It's a good thing. Then you don't have to fear. The Bible says, Whom shall I fear? He is the strength, the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? How does that verse start? Uh, you are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's how it starts. You are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
And then he starts naming the things he won't be afraid of. I won't be afraid of every little thing I hear on the news. I will have peace. I won't be afraid that the worst possible thing is going to happen to me or my family. I will have peace. He owns me. And if I have faith instead of fear, he'll come. He'll be fascinated. He'll come and he'll attach himself to me. And that's what I live for. Come on, God. I'm all good. Oh, God, you are my own. I have given you the deed. 